So Lee has written uh, uh, this a very provocative book called Breaking the Two-Party Doom Loop, the case for multi, uh, uh, multi-party <clears throat> uh, democracy in America. And I think it's... Uh, He's, it's going to be a very interesting talk, and he's recently been an author. Um, he's now, uh, he, w- he went to Berkeley, uh, got his PhD at Berkeley. He uh, teaches at John Hopkins. He's a, a senior fellow at the uh, uh, political reform group at the New America Foundation. And this book is quite provocative. And so he's also been involved with Kevin Cosner in this project called Congress Overwhelmed and trying to to make Congress great again, uh, talking about the reasons for uh, constitutional, um, why Congress is not doing its job. So he's going to make the connection tonight between um, uh, political reform, electoral reform, uh, emergency, uh, giving a, a better playing field to uh, uh, new parties right. in order to uh, uh, make the connection between that and, and uh, restoring Congress to its uh, constitutional role. So Lee, why don't you jump and uh, go ahead and we will, I apologize for the technical. That's okay. Um, all right, so, so I, I will start with the framers um, and the writing of the constitution. Uh, and you know, start with James Madison, who you know, is really the, the pri- uh, primary theorist uh, behind the constitution uh, and uh, and you know what what the framers were doing at the time was was quite radical to set up a system of self governance, and you know they didn't have a ton of models. They had a, some ideas on how politics uh, should work, and you know they set up this system of of government that that is still around with some modifications, and. They had, you know, some some ideas about how how politics ought to work. Now, uh, you know, the fundamental problem, uh, you know, that the framers are wrestling with, and this is, I think, the problem that Madison really lays out nicely in, you know, Federalist Number Ten, is this problem of of how do you build a legitimate government uh, in a diverse society, and you know, Madison wrestles with this problem says, well, you know, look, it's a diverse society and there's going to be factions, right? You know, it's inherent to liberty is people are going to disagree. Uh, And how do you manage a political system in which you can have those disagreements and you can uh, have productive resolution to them? And Madison's solution is basically that, you know, you should have these fluid coalitions that no faction should be dominant ever, and the faction should have to bargain with each other. And in the process, you build legitimate compromise. uh, And that's how government should work. Now, Madison was a, his first great cause had been religious liberty. And he was fond of a a saying from Voltaire, which I'll, I'll paraphrase, uh, which basically that, you know, if you have one religion, it's arbitrary. If you, if you have two religions, people are going, people are cutting each, each other's throat over what happens after you cut your throat and die uh, because they're trying to dominate each other. But if you have many religions, people can live in peace. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's basically Madison's theory of government is that you, you have to have, if, if you if politics in this, you know, was shared widely by, I think, a lot of the framers is what they feared, as John Adams quote, the, the greatest danger would be the division of the republic into two great parties, uh, because they had read, the framers had read their history, and they saw uh, that re- early republics and democracies declined when, you know, they, they got into a, a binary civil war. Uh, because what happens is that a dominant faction is going to try to dominate, a, a, a minority faction is going to say this system is not legitimate, and the whole thing is going to collapse. So this is why the framers were fearful of political parties, because they thought that what it would mean would be that you would have this, this binary split. Uh, now, you know, eventually they figured out that political parties are pretty useful, and it turns out that you know 230-odd years later, 
uh, we have learned that political parties are really essential to democracy because without political parties, everything becomes chaos and demagoguery. Some, some institution has to connect citizens and politicians and structure uh, conflict. But now that we have a genuine two-party system, uh, we are in trouble. Now, you might say, well, okay, but you know, haven't we always had a two-party system? Which is true, but one of the things that I think worked well in Madison's design, at least to prevent the sort of sort of binary partisan conflict, was federalism, which created a bunch of low, state and local parties that kind of that, and as a result, you had national parties that were broadly overlapping, didn't really stand for all that much. Uh, you know, over the last 60 years, American politics has nationalized tremendously, uh, and politics has split along urban rural lines, the, the organizing a political conflict around uh, social and cultural identity issues. Uh, and, you know, that, that has created this, this all, you know, all or nothing high stakes binary uh, two party system. Uh, which is incredibly destructive to the basic fabric of, of our democracy, because in order to have a, a functional democracy, we need some shared sense of, of legitimacy. Uh, the, the, we, we have to embrace the concept of legitimate opposition. Uh, and, you know, what we're seeing right now, um, post-election, is that there's a lot of Republicans who don't believe that Democrats can win legitimately. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I, I do wonder what would have happened if, if Trump had eked out some narrow wins despite being way behind in the polling, if we would be seeing, you know, Democrats trying to challenge the election. Uh, but, but things are what they are right now. Now, um, you know, John, you mentioned um, another book that I have out, uh, uh, co-edited volume with Kevin Kosar and, and at uh, AEI and Tim Lapira called Congress Overwhelmed, uh, which is a project we've been working on for a bunch of years, a bunch of leading Congress scholars uh, writing on the, the subject of Congress uh, basically being overwhelmed by lobbyists in the executive branch. And th that, that is actually the, the project that I had started before I started this, this Doom Loop book project um, on the case for multi-party democracy. And you know, one of the things when I, you know, I, I came to this, you know, before that I had written a book on corporate lobbying uh, and, and, uh, you know, and when I came to the issue of corporate lobbying, one of the things that struck me was how much the power of lobbyists uh, derived from the fact that Congress just doesn't invest in, it, in its own staff capacity. And there's this constant turnover. And so Congress is run by, you know, bright 26 year olds who just get snowed by, by lobbyists who bring all the expertise and, and, and pressure them. Uh, the uh, simple solution, of course, was that Congress should invest more in its own expertise and capacity as it did in, a, in an earlier era. Uh, and it seemed so obvious. And yet, it didn't happen. And, you know, as I pushed this, you know, I came to understand that, you know, a lot of members of Congress just see themselves as stuck in this partisan uh, warfare and party leaders have tremendous control. And this is, you know, the centralization, the, the polarization of Congress is how Congress became dysfunctional. Uh, and so I said, well, you know, this polarization problem is really important on a number of levels, but you know, one, one of the reasons why we should care about it so much is because Congress is the central institution of our politics. I mean, uh, this is, you know, again, back to Madison's vision, if you wanna have a diverse society with many factions, you need to have a, a, a pluralistic legislature. Uh, you know, a president by definition can't be a pluralistic institution, it's one person, but a legislature, it, it can bring the pluralism of the country. Uh, and, you know, there, there was a time, I, you know, I argue in the book that we had something more like a four-party system from the mid-60s, probably through the late 80s, which was a time when Congress passed a lot of important landmark legislation. Uh, and because you could, you know, uh, our system is is uh, designed to require broad compromise and you could build different coalitions depending on different issues. But when, when politics kind of collapsed into this binary starting in the 90s, it became much harder for Congress to do anything other than yell at the other party. And you know, as a result, Congress became a weaker institution because it couldn't agree on anything. And then you, you delegate 
power to the you know power power of whores a vacuum so the executive branch took over power so the you know the argument in the book is basically if we want to make our democracy work and have a stronger congress we need to get rid of the two-party system uh we need to have a, a functional multi-party system which is how most of the world's democracies operate the u.s is is very unusual in having a two-party system and parties can form coalitions and then you know congress can take its role back as a as the preeminent institution in our democracy. Good, um, excellent. Um, Bruce, let did me, you want to? Yeah, I, let me a couple questions. Lee, I, I wonder, you know, a multi party system's all that great. Take a look at Israel. Israel's, you know, it flourishes in diversity. There they say for every uh, three Jews, you have seven political parties. Yeah. And the governments there are very, very unstable. So simple multi-parties isn't automatically a solution. It may be obviously different in the U.S. environment. But putting that aside, a couple of observations. Lee, I'm up in Congress all of the time. One of the reasons, and you're absolutely right, they're not even 26-year-olds up there that are staff. They have no intellectual infrastructure. Uh, they pay the staff you know, $40,000, $50,000 a year, and then they move on because you can't even play a mortgage at that price. Uh, but one of the reasons why is that the leadership doesn't want the staff to know anything. Uh, all of the power, both in the House and the Senate, have, uh, have fallen and concentrated in the leadership, the House Speaker and the Majority Leader. Uh, and they dictate what budgets are. Uh, they've actually shrunk over the years as the executive branch has ballooned ever since Newt Gingrich shrunk uh, the congressional staff budgets and otherwise. Uh, so I don't know how you get around that. Uh, because the staff, at least at present, excuse me, the regular members are not inclined to buck Nancy Pelosi. They say she raises the money. I'm not going to go against her. And she just kind of dictates everything. Um, the last observation, I apologize for going on here, is that I think that uh, when you look at the unity of the parties, when it comes to war, the spending, um, it's really quite amazing that out of a, you know, say, a, right now we're running $6 trillion budgets you know, $3 trillion deficits, uh, the amount of percentage of that budget where there's serious disagreements is relatively small. Uh, we have a surveillance state where everybody agrees to notwithstanding Mr. Snowden to empower the national security agency to whatever they want. Uh, we have a warfare state where Congress gives away all the power to the executive branch. And even when we have so-called logjam, if you will, or gridlock in Congress, they have delegated so much authority to the president, the National Emergencies Act, he just continues with legislative rules when Congress does nothing. Um, I don't know whether there are any easy answers to such a pervasive problem, uh, well, but there's nothing clear. <laughs> there were easy answers, we'd have already figured them out. <laughs> um, yeah, let, let me take those points in order. So Israel. Um, so Israel is, is one uh, among you know, many multi-party democracies in the world. Uh, you know, on on balance, multi-party democracies are doing much better uh, than is most. I mean, Israel is not a representative multi-party democracy. Um, I mean, you know, if you want to pick Denmark, pick New Zealand, pick Germany, pick Ireland, pick Australia, though it's more of a two-party system. Um, you know, pick Sweden. Right? I mean, those are those, those are examples of, of multi-party democracies that are, are successful. So, no, I mean, I, I know people tend to kind of as soon as you say multi-party democracy, people tend to say, oh, well, look at Israel. I mean, Israel has some problems um, that are unique to Israel. Uh, I'm not sure that Israel would be a more functional system if it was if it were a two-party system. Um, and Israel also has a form of of hyper. PR, which actually is the same system that the Netherlands use and uses, and nobody ever points to the Netherlands as a, as a dysfunctional political system in which the entire, uh, and that, that is a, a party-less system in which the entire country is one electoral district, and then there's a very low threshold. Um, you know, there are a whole range of proportional systems. The, the, the systems that, that, I, that I recommend in the book is, is the Irish system. Um, yeah, and somebody else points out that that Israel has some, you know, has has a, a, an issue with the Palestinians, um, which kind of makes it also difficult to to have the same level of democracy. Um, uh, so the um, 
you know, I wouldn't point to Israel as the as the model. Um, but you know, the the what I recommend in the book is um, is is using the Irish system, which is uh, a, a, a form of they use ranked choice voting with multi member districts. Um, I also am partial to the New Zealand system. And New Zealand, by the way, uh, in the '90s, they used to they they had a Westminster first past the post uh, system, and they changed to a proportional system. They adopted the German system, actually. And one of the things is that actually they they went from running, you know, having a huge debt to actually running a surplus. It became much better financially managed uh, when they moved to a, a more proportional multi-party system. Uh, you know, the point about the. Um, the, the, the centralization of power in the house is, is exactly right. Uh, and, you know, I mean, that, that, that the leadership wants the members dumb and dependent on them. Um, now the leadership gains control because the members say, well, you know, we, you know, you, you help us win elections and we'll keep voting, uh, for you. Um, now when Congress was more functional invested in more staff, Congress had more of a, a strong committee and particularly a subcommittee system. And that's where a lot of the staff were. And that was because leadership was weak because the parties were diverse. Now, I think what you would see in a, in a multi-party system is you'd have more, and you see it in, in, in uh, parliamentary governments that are coalitional, you see a more, a more committee-based system uh in which you know you can you can build expertise and subject matter expertise so uh you know i think i think that would improve I, I, again I, I came to this conclusion because i wanted to improve the functioning of, of congress i see uh i see we have uh tim worth here uh former senator worth uh tim would you like to jump in here yeah, I'm, I'm uh, particularly interested in the latter part of the discussion that, you know, starting with what was earlier talked about, uh, uh, the abdication of the Congress and its um, title, its, uh, its uh, uh, constitutional responsibilities. You know, I was in the Congress during the, I would call the golden age of the operations of the Congress in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And that was not a time of weak leadership. It was a time, uh, to the contrary, of very strong leadership. When Tip O'Neill was an extremely strong leader. And he was a strong leader because he uh, was, was willing to delegate responsibility to the committees and let the committees operate and the subcommittees operate. Was willing to have centers of, of knowledge through the you know, various institutions like the Democratic Study Group and the Science Council and the Futures Coalition and so on to have a sea of ideas coming into the Congress on a steady basis. Uh, this allowed the Congress to do what it's supposed to do. And the Congress is supposed to be a way of, of reconciling uh, uh, interests all across the country. We cannot govern as a democratic society if the Congress is not working in reconciling these interests. I don't think that a party is gonna reconcile those interests or I don't see how you get to a multi-party system uh, and how they reconcile interests, more likely, it seems to me, you're going to get, you know, the, the, the Congress and members of Congress uh, being that, should be that reconciliation body. You know, that's from, to take it to its rudest form, that's what earmarks were all about. Um, earmarks were the ability of Congress and people in the Congress to trade back and forth mm -hmm. and be able to advance various pieces of legislation because, uh, what was one part of the country and one region of the country was uh, wanted X and another region wanted Y and members were helping each other out and that made the democracy work. I mean, that was a function of, again, the structure of the Congress of having strong committees. Uh, and you're quite right. I mean, Ginrich is a really, you know, becomes a real de uh, uh, very, very evil person in all of this because he destroyed uh, that whole committee structure and centralized power destroyed all of the information systems so that you're quite right. All information was centralized in his hands and it's remained that way, you know, in every speaker since for the reasons you point out accurately of, you know, getting elected and getting reelected. This is, I don't think this is gonna change until the Congress decides that it wants to try to claw back some of its responsibilities. And that's gonna take a period of time for the Congress to wanna to do that. And that's gonna take uh, good leadership in the Congress that's hope you know, we get to a point where, you know, you look at the current aging leadership of the Congress, it doesn't look to me like it's likely to happen there, but maybe there are some 
there's some really good younger people in the sort of the mid ranks of the Congress. Maybe somehow they can be encouraged to uh, do it as as uh, 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 Senator from Arizona used to say, uh, a return to the regular order. And there's a regular order which made the Congress work and made it made uh, our democracy a lot more effective. Anyway, I, I'm I'm a, for a, a return to Congress's ability, and I uh, maybe maybe parties become a function of that. But I'd start with Congress. Yeah, well, I, I, and, and you know, thank you for those comments, Senator. Uh, and you know, I, I, maybe I shouldn't have used weak leadership as opposed to decentralized leadership. That would probably be the, the, the more appropriate way to, to talk about that. And, um, you know, I, and I mean, I agree, members of Congress have to want to, to do it. Um, it's just everything has been so caught up in this, in this hyper partisan game of, of who controls the gavel uh, and who controls the, the majority that, the pasta you know, back in the oven. That, that everything you know get, gets caught up in that and, and you know the question is how you break that um, you know and I think the you know the uh, you know, to me it's it's the the two-party system and the way it's become such you know so nationalized has really undermined the ability of Congress to be this source of, of pluralism and diversity uh, and you know, everything's become so focused on, on which party wins the next election that, that it really undermines the ability of Congress to function. Okay. Uh, Danny, Danny Davis, uh, uh, you'd, like to, you'd like to start a, a new party to restore the Constitution. Why don't you jump in? Yeah, I, you know, I think that part of the big problem is that the current situation, the current circumstances, uh, would require Congress, the people who have the power, the people who benefit from the system as it is, to willingly cede some of that power. That they would have to make some changes and whatever, which would weaken their their ability to continue to dominate as they have. And I just can't imagine human nature being that they would ever do that. So I think that until we have an external forcing function uh, that's going to require some sort of compromise, but on, on almost any issue. So neither party if there was able to be one or even more parties that were able to get some seats so that neither party could gain an absolute majority uh, on their own, then they would be obligated to require to have to make coalitions or whatever like some other places do. Now, I understand totally there's some issues with that, but right now I would rather have something that has some issues rather than something that has, you know, it's, it's talons dug in deep and that we can't seem to even function in basic governance. In my estimation, when the Constitution was written and when the government was initially formed, <clears throat> the separation of powers were such that the expectation is that the Congress would be, you know, have its interest and the administration would have its interest in the, the judicial, et cetera. But because of the party has morphed into there's only two organs of power, and it doesn't matter whether it's Congress or the White House, it's, it's the party in either place that's against the party in the other place. So if you have, you know, the White House is the same as the Congress, then there's no separation and they're never gonna stand up against, the Congress is never gonna go against their sitting president of their party because it's the party's more important than the institutions, unfortunately. That's just how it's worked out. And until we change that dynamic, I just can't see any way that they're gonna willingly start to do what they were actually set to do and put a check on one part or one branch over the other. Um, I agree. Um, you know, and, and I think, you know, as a, as a point that you, you started with there is really important that if, uh, you know, parties have to, to build coalitions and work together to govern, then, then they will. But if, the, if, if everything in politics involves in just, you know, uh, trying to dominate the other party, and that, that is the, the, you know, the, the stated rationale. I mean, you ask Democrats, well, you know, what, what do we do about Republicans? Not, we're going to compromise with them. No, we're going to crush them. Uh, what, what, you know, you ask Republicans, well, what do we do about Democrats? Should we work with them? No, we're going to crush them. And, and you, you know, you, you, you look at, at how that's playing out in the stimulus talk, right? You know, I mean, Pelosi, uh, you know, when, in the summer, she says, well, you know, we're going to have some like, you know, she, she pulls out a number that's so large that she knows Republicans are never going to support it, puts in all this, all, all this stuff that Democrats want, says, you know, either they'll give us, you know, all these policies we want, 
uh, or, or nothing because they have to come to the table because you know Trump needs to get reelected. And if we don't pass this, it'll hurt Trump, right? So she's not gonna bargain. Now, Biden's about to be president and you know, uh, Pelosi and, and Schumer are coming begging to McConnell, basically saying, all right, we'll, we'll, take, we'll take your original offer. And McConnell's like, no, no, uh, you know, but we don't wanna do anything that'll help Joe Biden. Lee, if I could ask, I think that there's an additional complication here um, that that that's not addressed by whether you have double parties or multiple parties, and that is the character of the people who actually are elected. And let me describe a vignette um, just, uh, several months ago where I was uh, speaking to Jim McGovern, who's the chair of the Rules Committee, about the possibility of having amendments on the impeachment article resolutions. And he says, without embarrassment and with resignation, oh, Nancy said, we can't do it. You know? And that was the experience, and I'm up to Congress all of the time, less now with COVID-19. Well, Nancy says, we can't do it, so that's the end of it. There's no resistance. There's no effort to change the House caucus rules to give more democracy, if you will, to the committee assignments and the chairs. Uh, if you read the rules, it's all concentrating power in the executive, Pelosi, she appoints everybody on the Rules Committee, she appoints everybody on the House Intelligence Committee. You have to go through her filter to be a subcommittee chair and all of that. But the members, even though they outnumber her, outnumber her enormously, they simply accept it for some unknown reason as to asking, well, why would you want to be in Congress if you're just like a serf on a big plantation? I can jump in here if I could. Um, this is Pat Malloy. Hey, Pat. Uh, I had the great good fortune to work for 15 years in senior positions on the U.S. Senate Banking Committee. When Senator Worth was on that committee, um, he was a great senator on it. I, I left the uh, Senate to go into the Clinton administration in late 97, but I was there about 15 years prior to that. And what I, uh, I think money, the money in the political system is a big part of our problem, in my view. Right. Money wasn't as important in those days. I mean, my former boss, Senator Proxmire, ran his last campaign on like $150. Now you've got to raise, what, 20 million to run? Now, what this means is that the outside groups get enormous influence. Now, the second thing, that when, when I was there, if you if you left and went with a lobbying firm, it was you people would denigrate you as saying you sold out. Now they use the term you cashed in. Even members don't want to stay long anymore. They go off with these lobbying firms. The money in the political system is corrupting the whole damn place. Now, where does Pelosi get her power from? She raises money and doles it out to these members. And we used to say the committees are the engine room of the Senate. We would do hearings, develop legislation, and take it, to, write a, a report on it, and take it to the floor with the, you know, and you know, the majority leader played a big role in all of that. But this now it's the money. I'm telling you, these young people, they look on their time on the hill. And if and if you're gonna and if you're gonna go after the money, then you pay attention to the people who have the money and what you're putting together in legislation. So the, you you and and you got to deal with this problem if you're gonna have any hopes. It's not multi-party. I think you can deal with this. We our part we had two parties and it worked quite well for a number of years. It's just out of control now, and all of the outside interest groups now get funded by these billionaires. And they have enormous influence on how that place uh, behaves these days. So that's here, here. my take here, on here. it. Absolutely. Yeah. Are you with me, Senator? Absolutely right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I certainly agree that, that the, the money is, is a tremendous problem. And you know, I wrote a, a previous book um, called The Business of America is Lobbying that you know, listen to the, the growth of corporate lobbying and the way it has overwhelmed Washington. And so, you know, I agree that's a tremendous problem. Uh, so uh, you'll get no argument from me. Okay, thank you. 
But I think I have a question. Though, is, is, uh, is like the word we talked about a second ago. The people who have to change that are the people who benefit from it. And I 100% agree with you, Mr. Malloy, about the, the, the problem with money. I think a lot of people do. But the question is, how do we get that without an external forcing function? I, and if you can come up with one that I haven't thought of, I'm all ears, but I, I can't think of one. Well, let me tell you one more thing it does. And, and uh, Bruce mentioned the quality of the people who now run for office. If you know that you're going to have to go around begging for money in order to run for office, you attract quite a different type of person as we attracted 40 years ago, who wanted to go serve the great republic. People get turned, I mean, good people don't want to spend their lives uh, raising money. Uh, I, I remember one of, my, <coughs> one of my former bosses who didn't run again, said, I'm not going to go around begging for money from all these people. Uh, so I think you've got an enormous problem and I think we got to find a way to get money, uh, somehow get money out of this political system. Yeah. Well, I Hey, Lee, I have a question. Um, I, I support your thesis totally. I'm for a multi-party system because I think they do work better overseas uh, in other countries. But I'm just wondering, you know, you have to kind of uproot the whole political system to get that. I'm wondering, does your book give us any idea how, if you are for that, how do you get there? Yeah, I, I, have, a, I have a pretty detailed plan in the book. Um, you know, but the, the short version is, you know, con Congress can use its, you know, Article 1, Section 4 uh, authority to change how we do elections and have multi-member districts uh, for the House with uh, ranked choice voting. Um, the Senate, you know, I, I think we, I, everything that I propose in the book doesn't require a constitutional amendment. You can do ranked choice voting for, for the Senate. Now, if we are going to do a constitutional amendment, um, you know, we might think of having a, a, a class of national senators who are elected uh, through party list in, in compensatory seats like, like New Zealand or, or Germany, uh, which is an idea I've been thinking a little bit more about since, since the book. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, and I support campaign finance, although I, I think that, that we're in a, a kind of interesting moment now in which it, it's become a lot easier to raise uh, small donor contributions through the internet. And so that's kind of changing the way that campaign finance works a little bit. And I'm not sure, um, you know, how, how that will ultimately play out, but, you know, it's certainly certainly change the, the opportunities for how people fundraise campaigns. And it's, you know, I think change the types of, of candidates who can, who can run. And there are a lot more progressive Democrats now who are running uh, without taking corporate money uh, because of the strength of being able to raise money through the internet. Uh, you know, and, you know, HR, I mean, for, for all, you know, for all you want to complain about Nancy, Pelosi, and you know, there, there's fair fair amount of complaining about her. Um, you know, she is she has been extremely supportive of of HR one, which uh, includes a uh, public financing of elections provision, which creates a six to one public funding match for small small donors. Uh, and and you know, from what I what I can gather, like she actually deeply believes that this is the right thing to do. Uh, so, you know, I mean, they're the, the actually, actually, I mean, we're, we're, we're much closer to having public financing of elections. Uh, I mean, the bill has passed the House uh, and would have probably passed the Senate if Democrats to be able to get 52 or 53 seats uh, in the Senate. Uh, then we are to, to you know. But Lee, Lee, let me ask you on that score. You know, we had for years, you know, public financing of presidential campaigns. Remember, you had the checkoff. This was the Federal Election Campaign Act, 1974, yeah. after Nixon. And so soon, because you have a constitutional right to spend you know, limitless money that you raise on your own, according to Supreme Court decisions, then the candidates just rejected the public financing and said, no, that's too low. I'll just raise the money on my own, both Democrats and Republicans. How do you deal with that issue? Well, I mean, you know, get a 6-3 liberal majority to reverse Buckley v. Vallejo. Um, by, you know. I, uh, that's, that's got a long shelf life to that plan. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, I, I think you, you know, I mean, I mean, part of that is, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, the, the, the jurisprudence of the money is speech crowd on the Supreme Court has kind of made uh, that somewhat difficult. So, I mean, you, you just hope that you can empower through, through public financing, you can create pathways for enough people to come to Congress 
uh, without depending on corporate and wealthy donors. And then, you know, I mean, some people might still raise money from corporate, you know, money bads, but uh, you know, at least they at least there'll be enough people who are not dependent on corporate money bags to uh, to, to be covered. John, <clears throat> could I ask a question? Yeah. Sure. Uh, for me, it, it's Paul Horn. I'm an economist, not a politician. Uh, I'm wondering what changes in the rules in both the Senate and the House could block uh, the kind of brinksmanship, which I think Newt Gingrich began using the debt ceiling as a lever to force things his way, or I think of Mitch blocking Merrick Garland's a discussion of him as a candidate. What kind of changes in the rules could we envisage being useful? I mean, you know, Congress can set its own rules of of operation. Um, you know, I mean, you, I mean, you can imagine any. I mean, I'm not a. I'm not, I'm not a congressional rules person, um, as, but I mean, I think that I mean the part part of the challenge is. You know, and, and, and several folks have raised this is that members have to want to take the power back for themselves. And there's a reason that Mitch McConnell has power. And there's a reason that Chuck Schumer has power. And there's a reason that Nancy Pelosi has power. And there's a reason that uh, Kevin McCarthy has power is that at the beginning of every Congress, a bunch of members say, um, how are we going to run this place? And most people raise their hand and say, I've got a plan to run this place. And they say, oh, great. Somebody has a plan. Okay, great. All right, you know, and 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 they stand for re-election, and they help members get reelected, and you know they they make, they make decisions for them, and they keep they keep them from taking tough votes, uh, and then they run for re-election as as you know as the leaders of of the chamber, and nobody challenges them because no you know what whatever. You know, individual members may grumble that, you know, the place is being run dictatorially, but, you know, you can't be, uh, you know, you, you can't beat something with nothing. And, you know, the, 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 the dissent is not, is not organized uh, enough or coherent enough. Uh, and so that, that, um, you know, that's that. I mean, you know, I mean, Congress has been every every. I mean, Congress has been run differently, and you know, different different at different times. I mean, Mike Mansfield ran the Senate very differently than uh, uh, than than uh, Mitch McConnell or, or Harry Reid ran it. Uh, you know, we could have the Mansfield rules uh, of running the the Senate, but you know, then members of Congress would have to take tough votes on things, and. I don't want to have to do that. Lee, can I ask you to compare you know, two circumstances on, and what's the difference? And we had a two-party system you know, 100 years ago. At that time, you remember uh, Joe Cannon was the dominating speaker of the House, concentrated all power. And at that time, a combination of uh, George Norris, Republicans and Democrats overthrew Cannon, decentralized or devolved power. Sure. Uh, and and change things. We have the yeah. same two-party system today, uh, the same centralization of power, and nothing happens. What's the difference? Um, well, there's a big difference. Um, one is that politics is much, much more nationalized today um, than it was in, in 1910. Um, you know, I mean, you, you had two organized strong parties, um, but, you know, I mean, there, there wasn't you know, in, in the turn of the century, um, you know, the the, you know, the parties didn't really stand for all that much sub substantively at the national level. I mean, a lot of politics was basically the politics of, uh, politics of, of tariffs and, and currency um, and, you know, taxes to some extent, but there wasn't even a national income tax then. Uh, you know, most people were focused on local politics and local issues. Um, yeah, so that's one thing that's, that's different. Partisanship was much thinner at the time. Um, the, the other thing that, that's different, and you mentioned uh, uh, George Norris, uh, you know, leading progressive figure, is that there was a progressive movement that was orthogonal to the, to the two parties. Um, that, that was, I mean, I wouldn't say it was a center out movement, but it was just like, like there, were, there were progressives in both parties, 
um, <clears throat> who had a, a different vision of, of governance and, and government um, who were able to find common cause uh, that kind, in a way that upset the, the two party system. Uh, and you know there, there was a lot of a lot of frustration. I mean, there, you know, I mean, there there was a lot of frustration with with Cannon's you know yeah. or dictatorial uh, power then. You know, but it it was you know Congress was was much less institutionalized. Politics was much less nationalized. You know, I think it, it, I mean you know maybe something like that could happen again. Um, but do you see any George Norris in the current Congress? Um. I, AOC, I don't know. Um, you know, like I mean, they're they're certainly, you know, I mean, I mean, there's, you know, among some of the the, the more uh, raucous young members, you know, there there could be. I think. Can I ask a question. Yeah. No. Well, let me. Temporary. Uh, if uh, uh, that was taking place, where the states actually appoint their electors. So, but today was the also Go ahead. Day. Okay. Um, uh, Lee, I love your uh, ideas. I'm a longtime independent. I'm delighted to, to hear of your book. Um, I'm wondering where you're seeing support as you research the issue, just for the ideas in general. I know uh, younger folks are used to much more consumer choices. I went to the grocery store the other day to buy vanilla ice cream, and I think there were three or four kinds of vanilla ice cream. You go to buy oatmeal and there's about six kinds. Um, and so I think younger folks and, and uh, folks who've grown up in our current consumer economy are used to having more than two choices um, for oatmeal, for ice cream, and would like it for politics. And uh, I'm just curious where you're seeing interest and, and support uh, and signs of hope for that this could uh, attract a lot of support. Yeah, and not only can you have a bunch of, bunch of oatmeals and a bunch of vanilla yogurts, but you can have now yogurt that's made out of oat milk. Uh, so it's what, what a time to be alive. Uh, yeah, you're right. Young, young, young people are, are much more enthusiastic about, uh, about reform. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I talk to all kinds of folks, you know, I mean, really across the political spectrum who uh, are really frustrated with um, the way that our, our politics operate and and you know i think that we ought to have a multi-party system i mean it could be that people find me based on my book and so <laughs> come to me because they think lee know, can i jump back in if i wrote a book defending the two-party system maybe I'd, I'd get a lot of um support for for the two-party system let me jump back in again I, there are two other points uh, that, that i want to make about this money system john do you remember the night we had that congressman, Republican congressman from Kentucky. Yeah, Tom Massey. Tom Massey. And he came in and told, and this was new to me, that if you're a member in the House, you are charged by your speaker or minority leader. I guess he was speaking as a, as a Republican. That right. Each of them had to go out and raise so much money for the party. Yeah. Not for their own reelection, but the they, and then they've got judged on what the committee assignments and other things they got from their ability to do that. I mean, geez, it just it was astounding, astounding to me that this kind of thing was, was going on in, in, in the Congress. I don't, I don't think it goes on in the Senate, but it, it was amazing to hear this young congressman tell us what was going on in the House of Representatives. Yeah, if I could just add, because I had personal involvement in that, Pat. Uh, yeah. they, they have committees. They have tier A, tier B, tier C, uh, based upon how much money you can raise from the organizations you're regulating. Uh, and the tier A, when Thomas was there, was like you got to raise a million dollars. for That's ways and means, right? Yeah, yeah. Ways, ways and means, appropriations, banking, and currency. I drafted a bill for Walter Jones to make it criminal to solicit or ask or make any decision relating to a bill coming to the floor having a committee assignment uh, because of fundraising capability, because I view this as extortion. They're saying, okay, you got to, we're, we're demanding that you raise money for us, you know, in exchange for your committee assignment or subcommittee or getting a bill to the floor. I agree, utterly and completely scandalous. Yeah. And they're so unembarrassed that they actually send out invoices 
to the members. This is how much you owe in fundraising to us. You're under your so quota. Open and notorious. Yeah, open and notorious. And they weren't embarrassed about it. Yeah, Thomas didn't do any of it, but he had a reasonably safe district. Uh, but you can imagine that there was no enthusiasm for taking my bill and making it a crime to do yeah. what happens every day. And most Americans would be shocked at. Yeah, the other That's thing- a great rule to, change, Bruce. The other thing I want to add, just related to that, and again, I didn't know all this was going on until you know, 10 years ago. The members in the House, they spent a lot of their time leaving the building to go off to the separate building where they have offices where they just get on the phone every afternoon and call people to raise money. And yeah. then the staff, the staff is doing the bills, but then it, because they don't pay a lot of staff much money, the staff is enticed by the lobbyists to go become a lobbyist. So they draft, their, the, the, the incentives to do the right thing are all wrong in the system because of the money, in my view. Well, while all of these points are important, I'm sure there's an elephant in the room, which is the scope of government itself. There's a high correlation between what the government gets involved in and, and how important it is to raise money to make sure they do it your, your way. Mm -hmm. So along with many good ideas that are being raised here, one is to restrict the scope of government back to what is essential for the federal government. Well, good luck with that one. Um, yeah, can yeah. I make a contribution here? Just a question. Go ahead. Um, you know, and, and, and not, to, um, not to distract the uh, discussion here, but you know, I, I would actually disagree to the fundamental concept. Our problem is that we have two parties that are basically along the same glide path. We have an insufficient amount of diversity of opinion, diversity of views, the extreme parts of uh, what are called the extreme parts, socialism or right-wing fanaticism are discarded out of hand and not given enough attention. I think if we had a more diverse view of opinion, we'd be able to have a much more robust discussion about the issues and the power lines then would be aligned much more solidly than they are right now. Our problem is that the two parties are too much alike. Thank you. Well, that's another argument for more parties. Um, and and, uh, and I have to go in about five minutes, so I don't know if you want to do a final lightning round. Of right. um, here. I make a comment along those lines. Can you hear me? Um, I'm a political psychologist, also independent. And the two party system creates a dualistic black and white concrete thinking. And then there, and um, instead of differentiation of the opposite, well, it's gotten more severe, which is like splitting of the opposites, which is pathological. But there are two boxes, and you know, you have to be in this box or that box. And if I'm in this box, I have to oppose, I have to accept all these different variety of things in this box and oppose the other one. And a question that I have for you, and I appreciate your work very much, is it seems like there are clusters that would be natural parties, like say Green Party, progressive. Those, uh, libertarian, evangelical, centrist, Democrats, Trump's base. So the, it seemed like there are groups that naturally um, form parties. So what do you think about that? Well, I think your point about the, the, the danger of binary thinking is, is you know, incredibly important. And certainly I've, I've read a lot of political psychology um, that, that reinforces that, um, that, that when people get into a, a binary situation, you know, it becomes very easy to, to stereotype the other side to, and it forces you to engage in this kind of us versus them thinking, which simplifies things incredibly. It turbocharges confirmation bias. Um, so all of those things, yes. Um, you know, are there clusters? You know, I mean, the, the electorate, when you plot the electorate, you know, along, along an issue space based on polling questions, you find much more diversity and complexity than the two party system allows for. Uh, you know, I, I think some of it would depend on, you know, I mean, parties, uh, you know, uh, would, would form and would, you know, would, would kind of shape the, the potential choice space. Um, but, you know, I think you could find that, I mean, clearly on the left, there's a split between the 
the more, you know, socialist Democrats, you know, sort of Bernie Sanders wing and the more moderate Democrats, the, you know, sort of Joe Biden wing. Um, you know, in the Republican Party, I think you'd find a kind of three-way split between something resembling more of, a, of a, an older moderate Republican Party, um, you know, like a, like a Charlie Baker or a, or a Larry Hogan. Uh, you'd find something more like a, a kind of like a traditional, you know, conservative, you know, free market conservative, something like a Paul Ryan, or Ted Cruz, maybe. Um, and then you'd find something that's more of a, of a populist nationalist, which is sort of sort of what Trump campaigned as, um, you know, sort of Tucker Carlson, I think Josh, Josh Hawley is kind of in that space. Uh, and, you know, I think you'd see a small libertarian party, uh, but I think it would be pretty small. Uh, there's not a lot of people who, who are actually libertarians. Um, and you know, they maybe I think I think I think what the Green Party would probably largely be absorbed into the to the social social democratic party. Um, uh, so that would that would seem to be the nat natural six party system. A, a final comment. Good. <clears throat> um, uh, who, who's, uh, <clears throat> go ahead. Yeah, Lee, I, I just want to say, you know, after listening to this whole con uh, conversation, you know, I think Lee's ideas are, are, are worth supporting. And, you know, obviously everybody has to figure things out for themselves, but I don't think we should lay on him the, the burden of solving all political, uh, uh, you know, problems. Uh, you know, the money problem is a very serious problem and, you know, fixing the parties is not gonna, you know, you know bring, bring heaven. On the other hand, it seems like a concrete, reasonable thing that we can, you know, that a lot of people can support. Uh, ranked choice voting is growing in Maine and many other states, so the mechanism right. is is getting popularity. And then finally, um, even if it doesn't happen, by talking about it, perhaps we pressure the two parties to up their game. Yeah. I have a question, and it has to do with the growing contrast between Americans as they are today and Americans as they were at the time of the writing of the Constitution. We all know the phrase e pluribus unum out of many one. And the question is, what is it that might keep a people unified in the midst of diversity? And if you look at the personages of the people who produced the Constitution, you find that they had a common culture. It's not that they lacked disagreements, they had plenty of them, but they had just about the same background. And what background was that? They had their Christianity, although there were different varieties of it to be sure, and they had a classical education to become something in American society in those days. You had to get deeply educated in the classics. And you read the Federalist Papers and you understand that echoes from Ru Rome and Greece are on their minds all the time. So they could <clears throat> derive a sense of commonality from the kind of education, the cultural background that they shared. Nowadays, we are talking about the American people as made up not of a sort of common human ground or appealing to a common human ground, but we want to split everything up we have to talk about blacks and women and we have to take uh, talk about uh, evangelicals and uh, I, I could go on and give you a very lengthy list what the framers were thinking was that human beings are by nature going to be di diverse the problem if we're going to have government that serves the common good is to have broad-minded people people who were actually above the partisanship of the moment. That is, we should do our utmost to stay away from the partisanship. We talked about um, uh, the danger of factions. They were especially afraid of a majority faction. Their whole mentality was to find the unum that would make the diversity function. But today, partisanship, it seems, is overwhelming virtually everything. And the money, of course, poisons the atmosphere even more. And so I'm afraid we have to start thinking of America, not as a republic, unless we're going to call it the banana republic. We are virtually 
there, and we see it all around us. Joanne? All right, well, I, I have to run, but um, so I, I, I thank you for the opportunity to, to have this conversation. And I mean, I, I, you can you can all continue if you want. Um, but, but thank you, Lee. Yeah, thank you, yeah, thank Lee. Lee. Thank you. Yeah. I, I can't resist, Klaus, but what about the women and the Blacks and the Native Americans? No, they weren't quite <laughs> within the E Pluribus <laughs> Unum. No, yeah. they stayed outside. And I say that not to discountenance what you're saying, um, but you know you can't just jump forward and ignore history. Um, no, I'm not suggesting there, there's a reason, that. There's a reason for the diversity. Maybe it's overstated, and it has its own disadvantages. But it isn't just because we became, you know, people just became crazy and decided they wanted you know, special interest or representation. Uh, you know, this is where a page of history speaks volumes of logic. It doesn't mean we can't improve on where we are now, uh, but the framers, as brilliant as they were, were not the golden age either. I'm not okay. saying, there's never any golden age. That goes without saying. It doesn't, it doesn't need to be said. Right. But you can't have diversity without the union or the society breaks apart. And that is what is happening today. It has been happening. We could have seen this on the horizon a long, long time ago. And now we have it. The society is fragmenting. And yeah. it's because the center cannot hold. It will not hold any longer. And we've brought this upon us. So this is what a uh, banana republic is. And we have to start to live with it if we can. Yeah, well, I agree. And that's I started this constitution restoration project. It used to be everybody at least could unify around the Constitution. It's what Jefferson said in his first inaugural. We may have disagreements of opinion, but not disagreements yeah. of principles and how we resolve our differences. Today, I mean, the Constitution's a scrap of paper. Both yep. sides, you know, discountenance it any day that they feel you know, they don't want to comply with it. Uh, some of the debate that I've heard about <laughs> you know, the election challenges, I said, have you ever actually read the Constitution? Have you read the Electoral Commission law and the obligation to pay for the laws? Um, and uh, and that was our point of unity. We no longer have that anymore. Uh, I see Larry DeCara uh, from Boston. Larry, uh, you're probably the most political person in our Harvard class. Uh, what do you what do you? Uh, what do you think? I think that, um, the likelihood of having a, a multi party system in the near future is very very slim, primarily because of the. Money, uh, Pat Malloy talked about the money which is raised uh, in oh. enormous amounts, uh, which keeps the two parties going. Yes. And I regret that, but I think that's uh, that's likely to be the case uh, for the foreseeable future. And I also regret that we don't have a lot of the quality people in Congress. I think for some of the reasons that were referenced, that people do not necessarily want to have a job where they spend half their time raising money. Uh, see, Josh, uh, Josh Javits, uh, Josh, you, uh, uh, if your dad was, uh, uh, Senator Javits was alive today, what would he, what would he say? Well, he, uh, he's not, he, he lost his last election because of the concentration uh, on the right uh, with Reagan in 1980. Uh, so I think he would regret uh, the loss of the wingman on the Republican side and the Democratic side. Uh, as the speaker uh, noted, there were essentially four parties uh, in the 60s and 70s, uh, and they uh, coalesced into two. So unfortunate. I, I think he'd also uh, endorse what was said before, and that is regular order uh, and bringing... Uh, legislation through subcommittee, committee uh, to the floor, uh, and the independence of senators and congressmen is absolutely essential. He was given license uh, to, uh, to write and bring legislation and see how much support he could get. That kind of license is uh, denied by the leadership today, uh, unfortunately. Yeah, and we have this chicken and egg problem, I think, for the precise reasons that you described. That is, not only would you not want to run for Congress if most of your career is raising money, 
But why would you want to run for Congress if you don't get to do anything unless you're the speaker? You know, you, you need to stay there for 40 years and then maybe you get one bill or one post office named after you. So, so and without quality people, then this, the, 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 the speakers and the leadership runs wild over everybody. And I don't know how you get out of that, uh, that log jam, if you will. Hey, John. Yes. Uh, yes Todd. Yeah, if I may say something, and if anybody uh, here is, reads Committee for the Republic, you know, Chaz Friedman's email list, uh, which I comment on too much, maybe, but uh, you can probably get the sense that I'm really critical of conservatism. And John, Donald Trump administration has really brought into focus its faults to include its alliance with libertarians. And when you begin thinking of it, uh, in terms of imperialism and war, perpetual war, et cetera, uh, you can see that for 20 years now, virtually, uh, we've, we've been doing, the parties do this, Carl Schmitt's friend-enemy distinction. You know, it goes to this binary thinking that are, is built into our system, like uh, uh, a couple speakers before, the political psychologist whose name I know, but it's slipping my mind at the moment. But uh, so there's more goes on uh, with any consistent, system rather than just what we uh, see. And it goes to what Hannah Arendt talked about was how consciousness, and this is what the Israelis understand in their propaganda effort, it's the battle for consciousness. And so there's a consciousness that takes shape during wartime that becomes ever more hostile uh, to the enemy. And that could be the domestic enemy. And I think we're seeing that between the two parties. Trump uses it, uh, Cheney began it, uh, Trump took it to a finer art. Republican Party is all about identifying the enemy. You look at uh, the, the latest thing going on about Trump and the people calling for a coup. Uh, the name of it slips my mind, but it's, but it's uh, Mark Levin. Mark Levin. Mark Levin has been calling for a constitutional convention now for 15 years or so. And when you look at it, it's all about overthrowing the old constitution. Let's come back and get rid of this uh, Bill of Rights, for example. Or you, you look at originalists like uh, Bill Barr. When he talks about originalist uh, constitutional interpretation, as he made plain at the Chelsea and Hillsdale College, it means the original constitution without the addition of the Bill of Rights, which as Bruce recently pointed out, is incorporated into the constitution. But yet we have these originals saying, no, 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 the Bill of Rights, that doesn't matter. So going to, and I'm really down on conservatives because they think that They've abandoned Edmund, Edmund uh, Ker, uh, Burke, who was a reformer. You know, they would treat Burke now as a liberal, you know, as maybe somebody out of Hollywood, uh, you know, cultural Marxist, because he was against slavery. He was against the uh, treatment of Indians during the uh, British imperialism and against the treatment of the, the uh, Irish and against the treatment of the Americans. Uh, so today he would be called a cultural Marxist probably by conservatives, but he was a reformer. And, he, and that was what his program was. The fact that he opposed the French Revolution didn't mean that he was a reactionary. It just meant that he was a liberal reformer. Yeah, I'll open it. And, and so that's what's been lost to conservatives. They blame everything on Hollywood or the culture. The question should be asked instead is why 100 years later, we're still worshiping Confederate statues. And by 100 years later, I mean, they only came into existence during the time when we were preparing our, our overseas imperialist adventures to, to help enculturate the people in, a, in an adoration of warfare. Anyway, I've gone on quite a bit here, so I'll stop. But the point is, we need to begin, I would argue, and, and this has all been a good start with the exception of reversion to conservatism, uh, to begin breaking out of the way we have been thinking, both of the two-party system, but also the division of liberal conservative. I mean, AOC, Ilan Omar, they oppose our wars, but yet conservatives, even anti-war so-called anti-war conservatives denounce them as socialists instead of having a dialogue with them and bringing them into the conversation. Uh, and so there's a, it's a much deeper problem here. Hannah Arndt, whom I recommend everyone to read, uh, beginning with Crisis of the Republic, for example, uh, and, uh, and, and you know, she, she thought differently than the vast majority of people, but in a more higher level way. And I would argue that's what we need to begin searching for and attempting to uh, arrive at a higher level of our thinking today than what we've been doing in division into conservative and what we de deem liberal. But uh, it has, it's ruining us and we need to break out of it. Anyway, I'll stop there.
uh, Hed Hedrick Smith, I, I see uh, uh, Rick on. Uh, Rick, uh, you uh, uh, gave us a great salon about how we're basically the middle class has been flat for the last 50 years, and we know what the consequences of that are. And you, you've got a website, and uh, where are you on the issue of uh, uh, a multi-party system and, and uh, electoral form at the national level? I know you're very focused at the, lo at the state level local level but where where are you <clears throat> well uh john for <laughs> you've got a lot of other people with much more important things to say than i do but you know for a long time i have felt and you'll see this uh certainly in the reporting and the writing uh, on um, my website reclaimtheamericandream.org i've felt that we had to do gerrymander reform that that partisan gerrymandering uh was one of the most pernicious uh, practices that's built up over a couple of centuries in America. And what is striking is that there really has been a reaction against it. Uh, in 2018, two years ago, there were five states that adopted gerrymander reform on the basis of citizen initiative. One of them, Missouri, rolled it back this year. The politicians, I think, basically tricked the people with a very um, confusingly worded uh, ballot initiative. And the majority that voted for gerrymander reform voted it out, uh, two years ago, voted it out this year. But I think that's really important. I think we'll actually see some impact of gerrymander reform in the election of 2022. And I don't see any discussion of that in the media at the moment as people are looking forward to 2022. So, I, I mean, I think that's that's you know terribly important. I think the ability of uh, the system to have some kind of regulation of funding uh, uh, is going to be necessary, but I can't see how we can get there uh, with a constitutional amendment. Uh, and so I've been impressed by the impact of public funding of elections in a state like Connecticut. It's utterly amazing. This is a voluntary system. Uh, and 80% of the um, candidates for the state legislature and about the same percentage of the candidates for statewide office, governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, state treasurer, and so forth, um, have taken it now over a, a course of five election cycles. And it has really um, reduced the power of money and money lobbyists. Lobbyists still have power, but their power is through the reason of their argument and the kind of popular support they can summon and not through the size of their checkbook. Uh, uh, it's had a terrific effect on the, um, uh, the operation of the Connecticut legislature. So, I mean, I think those are things that are important. I happen to be one of those that thinks we've got to do something about the electoral college. I really wonder uh, how much longer this union can stay intact and not uh, even worse at each other's throats uh, when you have such a lopsided uh, mismatch where 17, what is it, 17 or 21 percent of the population of the country can elect a majority of the Senate on a regular basis. Um, and when you get to the point that Texas and Florida are changed uh, by the demographics changing in those states and they become purple states, uh, it, I, I just think the imbalance between uh, the states with the population and with the economic dynamism versus the states that have the electoral votes and have control of the Senate, and actually many of which are still gerrymandered, is going to tear this country apart even more than Donald Trump has in a more fundamental way. Uh, so I think we need to address these issues, whether or not the uh, uh, yeah, and I think another way we need to go is we need to look at ranked choice voting. And uh, you were talking about a multi-party system. I was amazed to see that Alaska adopted uh, the nonpartisan primary and ranked choice voting this year. Uh, it came close to succeeding in Florida. I didn't pass, but I was surprised to see that it was even on the ballot in a significant way in Florida. Uh, there are two sets of people moving in very opposite directions in this country, not just opposed to each other in partisan terms, <clears throat> but seeing very different uh, paths toward making our uh, republic 
for our representative democracy work better. Um, and uh, I despair because of the difficulty of getting um, the kind of dialogue, John, that you encourage and people talking across partisan and ideological barriers to each other and trying to sort this stuff out. Uh, and I, I worry about what we're going to see starting next January, February, March. We, we have a, um, a dystopian political system at the moment, and I don't see how we get out of it without fixing some of the uh, elemental election law reforms that are needed. Rick, could you address one of Danny Davis's observations? How do you overcome the conflict of interest to have the people who benefit from the current system vote to diminish their own power? At the, unlike at the state and local levels, at least many of them have referendums, so at least you can appeal to the citizens to take on the vested interest. But how can you get Republicans and Democrats to vote to change electoral rules when they profit by them? Well, that's a very good question. And Virginia is a tragic example of that. The Democrats were all in favor of a bipartisan independent commission to handle the redistricting system in the state of Virginia, so long as the Republicans were in charge of the legislature. Uh, and they were all for it. They were pushing for it very hard, 2016, all through 2018, 2019. And then lo and behold, they won control of the, uh, the legislature in 2020 and the legislative leadership flopped and went exactly the other way and they were against it. You're, you're right. Um, it, it, it is really the states that have uh, the option of popular ballot initiatives and referenda that have the opportunity to change the system fundamentally. And what is amazing is how it happens and where it happens. I mean, it does happen in places like Alaska and North Dakota, not just um, as a matter of fact, it's done better there than it's done in Massachusetts or New York. So some of the labels that we have um, and the assumptions that we build into them, that is liberals and progressives, they're in favor of reforms and Democrats, they're in favor of reforms and Republicans and conservatives are not. I don't think actually pan out in practice. Um, and so I'm, I recognize the hurdle you're talking about. It is huge, um, but even despite that, there are more and more people recognizing at the state level, and at the state level, particularly if you get away from elected politicians, there are more and more people of common sense who say we have a dysfunctional system, we have to fix it, and they're coming to understand that politicians as a class, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, have an interest in a system which enables them to stay in power, whether it's gerrymandering, uh, fixing the vote, voting system one way or another, um, keeping the political money system going the way it is. More and more people, and their business people uh, often um, on one side and their intellectuals and academics uh, on, on the other side uh, and lots of ordinary people who are frustrated and say, damn it, in the city of St. Louis or the city of Denver or the city of Phoenix or the city of Portland or the city of Birmingham, Alabama uh, or St. Petersburg, Florida and elsewhere, we're tired of this. We want a nonpartisan primary. We don't want the city council to be gerrymandered we don't want outside money coming into our politics, um, and we don't want big money, uh, even inside money, in our politics. And um, you are finding in some places that cities are leading the way, and then cities lead the way to states. It, you know, this is a this is a um, we've had barnacles growing on our boat, a political boat, for a long time. It takes a long time to scrape them off. But uh, I would say the last ten years demonstrate that quite a bit of that has been happening despite the various obvious obstacles that you just referred to and many others as well. Uh, What's interesting about politicians is the minute they get out of office, an awful lot of them are in favor of reforming the system that they were in and they'll tell you how much they hated it while they were in it and they wish they could reform it. Um, uh, and, I, and there are a bunch of them that have gotten together in a reformers caucus 
which uh, to my disappointment has never really been effectively mobilized to promote reform at the state level. I'm not a believer that it can happen at the federal level, given the hyper-partisanship and the polarization. Uh, Rick, uh, it's Tom Mann's back in Washington. Excuse me, I missed something here. Is Drutman not here tonight? We're now just having a chat. Oh, he, he's he gone. He, he left. Oh, you mean I came an hour late or something? Yes, you came an hour late. <laughs> oh, Jesus, I'm sorry. <laughs> he left at eight. Well, that's too, uh, that's too bad. He's a great guy. I, I bet he was terrific. Yeah. Uh, can, I, can I just bring up something? Yeah. Uh, John, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Virginia just voted to have uh, a commission in charge of redistricting. Am I uh, not mistaken? Am I not correct in that? Yeah, you are correct in that, but but yeah, it's a hybrid commission. It's not a real. It's a it's a partial gerrymander reform. What happened was the Republicans understood they were about to lose control of the state legislature, and so rather than set up a truly independent commission that would be all citizens in which the politicians would have no role, and would not be appointing any of the members. They said, we'll go, we'll go half the membership. We'll set up an eight member commission for whom will be politicians, for whom will be citizens. And the Democrats were so desperate to get something done that they went along with it. And then when they took control, they said, oh, well, that's really not a very good uh, reform. We really ought to go further. But also they saw they could gerrymander the districts themselves. So the answer is, is there's a sort of a partial reform that was voted in. And the um, state party, Democratic Party of Virginia went out, the leadership went out and said to the voters, don't vote for it. But the, their own voters ignored them. So there is a, there's a halfway house. And that's, uh, in my opinion, that's better than none, but it's not very good. What is the difference between Virginia 2021 and fair vote in Virginia? Brian Cannon left 2021, formed his own group. Well, I think just what I was describing, I don't know, I, I've talked to Brian Cannon many times, but I have not talked to him since he formed Fair Vote. Um, I think the answer is that Brian got done about as much as he could on gerrymander reform that he thought possible. And I think he's now moved on to another form. My understanding is Fair Vote is ranked choice voting. It's, it's the idea is here to give much more voice to independents Right. Uh, sing, have a single party, uh, a single uh, primary. By the way, I, let me just bore you, if, if I can, for for one more moment on this issue of of of, of the nonpartisan primary. Almost nobody knows anything about the track record of that system in the state of Washington, which adopted it well before California, which is a far more well known case. It had been through six cycles in Washington. One of the ideas is that you can get more turnout if everybody is allowed to vote in the primaries, including independent voters who are an increasing portion. In fact, they're a larger portion of the American electorate today than either Republicans or Democrats. Well, that's happened in every off year election. You can't use presidential elections because the turnout varies very much with uh, the intensity of interest in the presidential race. But in every off year election since this was adopted, Turnout has gone up in every single congressional district in the state of Washington, and there are 10 districts, six held by Democrats and four held by Republicans. The second thing is uh, that people argue uh, for this system is that if you have everybody run in the same primary, uh, you no longer have the primary advantage to extremists, where the turnout is very, right. very low. I mean, where the base dominates, yeah. The state primary vote, for example, where uh, uh, well, state primary votes can be, Terry McAuliffe won the nomination of Virginia with a 3% turnout, okay? So I, that's, that's ridiculous. So if the turnout goes up and you have everybody running together, everybody voting together, the pressure will be on people to be more moderate, have more variegated positions, not just be extremists. And in fact, what's happened in the state of Washington, both in the Republican Party and in the Democratic Party, Candidates who ran second because they were 
maybe not centrist, but closer to the center than the extremes in their party. They ran second in the primary and they run first in the general election. So you have a woman right. named Susan Del Benny, who's a former Microsoft executive, who is a business oriented Democrat winning in a very liberal district in Seattle. And you have Dan Newhouse, who's a longtime rancher, uh, re mainstream Republican, winning in a district that was Tea Party for decades before the Tea Party was even invented. Uh, so they get elected. So the idea that you might get some more moderate candidates or less extreme candidates elected has also been known. But the real payoff yeah. is when they get in Congress. And I'm sure you all know about VoteTrack.gov, which tracks the uh, voting records of members of Congress over time. And what they found out about the state of Washington is that none of the 10 members of the Washington State Congressional Delegation, now this is not this Congress, this is the last Congress, the last complete Congress that they had ending in, um, uh, in, the, in the, 20, it's the 2018 Congress, not the 2020 Congress, um, 2017, 2018 Congress, that none of the 10 representatives had a voting record in the outer 20% of their party. In other words, all 10 of them, Republicans and Democrats, were somewhere near the center of the, of the playing field. They were not in the red zones, of, as football would put it, um, of either party. If we had 10 states that did that, Congress would actually start working again. Yeah. I mean, right. it, it, is, it is an absolutely stunning, but totally unknown set of facts about a reform uh, that is actually working very well. And what happens is that once you have that kind of record, then the candidates begin to understand that's what the voters want and they begin to run that way. So you have the elections actually reinforcing the behavior in Congress and the behavior in Congress reinforcing the, the elections. And the faces change, the names change, but the impact persists. Well, uh, that was Rick, good. Rick, that was... Uh... Excellent. Uh, uh, Josh, Javis, do you, uh, uh, all these reforms that have been discussed, uh, where do you see the uh, um, uh, a new party uh, playing a role in promoting all these things that a uh, shopping list of things? Uh, well, I think uh, uh, what Rick said, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, there is, uh, there are a lot of independents out there. Uh, and there's a lot of motivation uh, to uh, to break up the uh, the hold, the unilateral hold of the party system. Also, I think the um, uh, you know the phenomenon of the internet. I don't know if anybody's mentioned that, uh, but the type of diversity that that people are looking for uh, in the uh, in the internet and have found um, if there were a way for them to exhibit that kind of diversity uh, and rank voting, uh, you know, is, is an example of it. Uh, I think there, there's a, there, there'd be an interest. Um, so I think the demand is out there. The supply is, uh, is, is very narrow. Um, third parties have, uh, haven't been very successful in, uh, in the last hundred years at least. Um, so tough, tough to do uh, to have diversity within a party. I think uh, is the more realistic uh, uh, goal. Good. Who else? Could... Hey, John. Yeah. John, can you hear me? Yes. So, I was just going to say, this is Jack. It's great talk. Um, one thing I heard the Democratic Committee in Virginia uh, people were, were saying that uh, it, it's as Rick described it, you know, the Republicans were, were not at all interested in any kind of fair fair district redistricting until they were losing power. Then all of a sudden they decided fair districting was real important. And the uh, what the Democratic Committee people said, the problem with that commission that was set up, first of all, it's not all citizen members, you know, but it's, um, it's four and four. And apparently if it's deadlocked, it goes into, which it will, which it easily could be, it'll go into the courts and the, the Republicans have been in power a very long time and the court system is very, very heavily conservative Republican. 
and they're saying if it goes into the courts, it's really likely to be just, you know, to to be decided along kind of partisan lines. I don't know if that's a tortured explanation, but that's what I heard several times when I was that's I and other people were questioning it. Can I, uh, can the, I the validity that? to that complaint? Yeah, it, it was a reasonable. I was not sure it's really valid, but I was going to say that what we're really talking about here a lot is just that. Um, uh, and it's not not here. It's all over the world. It's extremely difficult, apparently, for a successful, developed Democratic republic and a successful, developed market economy to avoid turning into some degree of oligarchy. And it kind of, and U.S. history is a constant back and forth between the two. Now, I always love the old crusty Tory English aristocrat who said, "Revolution? Aren't things bad enough already?" <laughs> I, I'm a member of the uh, Central Committee of the Democratic Party of Virginia, so I can just speak on the issue that you just raised, Jack. Um, what, in order to get a constitutional amendment in Virginia, you have to pass it in two state, two straight legislatures. Now, so uh, the issue, the party was for the reform the year before that passed. And then this year it flipped. But most Democrats, I think, wanted to vote for this because if we didn't get it this year, who knows when we would have a chance to get it again. It might so, revert, it and, might revert, and, and, yeah, and the, yeah. And the thought was, take what we can get, and then if we can improve it later, fine. But we better get what we can. So even though the party at the Central Committee level said go against it, our own Alexandria Democratic Committee said, no, that's up to you guys to decide how you want to do it. Yeah. It went over overwhelmingly. You know, it won in the, in the state. Yeah. Yeah. Fairfax Committee said the same thing. Yeah. John, no sound. John, sometime, somehow you've, you've lost your sound again. Shall we just uh, close things up? <laughs> do you, do you can speak? Give me, who can give me a fast summary of, of, of the four key points that Lee Drutman made? <laughs> <laughs> this is for credit now. This is for credit. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> Hell, it's for, a, it's for a couple of rounds of drinks. Yeah. Yeah. Federalism. Um, and I, I, I personally don't think that's the central issue. I think, uh, as you know, Rick, yeah. I, I think money and politics is an enormous problem with this whole system. Having well, he was, he, Lee was certainly talking about that a, a good amount. Not in the beginning. Not in the beginning. We raised yeah. it, uh, yeah, and then he got into it, yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'd be interested in any views people have on uh, how much disruption uh, Trump could cause going forward. In other words, we've, we're mirroring the point when the Electoral College results are going to be, well, they've already been certified except for Wisconsin and then, and then uh, announced to be a vote. Uh, how long can he can he persist in this, and to what effect can he uh, manipulate his his extraordinarily large uh, money donating following? Can he manipulate them into uh, becoming a real uh, kind of a of a leverage against the results of the election? Is that no, 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 no. or is that over? Nothing. It's over. It's done. It's done. It's done. nothing. Yeah, but Trump hit a nerve. He Trump hit a nerve in that 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 the reason he got elected. I mean, I'm repeating what we people have been saying for quite a while. That still exists, and and he hit a nerve. Carl Jung said that Hitler was not a lone madman. Said he was he was a manifestation of the German undersoul, the bitter, angry, defeated, humiliated, you know, full of pain and rage. And Hitler was channeling it. And Trump is kind of tragedy and then farce. But Trump has kind of done the same thing. He's channeling something that's very deep, very angry. Walter Russell Mead writes about this. He's a conservative, but he talks about this populist anger. And Trump is channeling that populist rage. 
Oh, you know, so, speaking from the court Midwest. Today, Supreme Court today put a nail in the coffin. Finally, good. And they denied cert. So speaking from the Midwest, uh, you know, the, the, really the place, the upper Midwest is where populism began on a very positive reason, you know, because farmers and laborers were really being deprived of the fruits of their labor back in the 1890s and early 1900s. There's nothing wrong with populism. The way, <laughs> oh, no, no. the way it is taken by Trump and demagogues, that's what's wrong with populism. Yeah. They take it in the direction of fascism. And the term fascism is in the, I'm reading a book right now on Caesarism, Bonapartism, and uh, something else. But uh, in any case, uh, these terms are all synonymous with fascism. We think fascism was only you know, unique to 1930s and 40s Italy, but it's simply a system, a form of political thinking that goes back to Machiavelli, Thomas Hobbes, and back to the Roman Republic, which was not such a republic as it was really too frequently an imperialistic dictatorship, even though it was still called a republic. So, so that's a problem with going back to the ancients. You still have to distinguish thought, good thought from bad yeah. thought. And just saying we got to go back and study ancients is, you know, this is what Leo Strauss took advantage of. He said, go back and study these guys, because most of them were fascist oriented thinking. And that's what Strauss had admitted he was a fascist. So the point is, uh, Trump, I think the harm he's done already is irreparable because he has taken genuine legitimate grievances, but has channeled them, like you say, into a very demagogic, dog, demagogic way. But he's also had a lot, and other people have mentioned this, he's had a lot to build upon, 20 years of war, just like Hitler had uh, you know, a couple decades of German militarism before the Nazis came along and exploited that, as many good sound thinking Germans recognized, Jewish Germans who got out, recognized way back in the 1940s. So that's my point. We got to look at things a little deeper and not just look at the surface appearances and realize that there's something more going on here that unless we get it right, we're, we're lost as a republic, which I would say we already are. Question is, but can we recover it now? But there's reasons why Trump got elected. Absolutely, absolutely. He, he, he tapped into something and it's all over the West. There's too many people oh. left behind, abandoned, betrayed, yeah. pain, rage, you know. Exactly. Huey Long tapped it the first time. And yeah. Hitler and Mussolini and many others. Sometimes liberals have tapped into it. Sometimes and, and progressives for, have. And for um, good reason. People should not be left behind. I mean, if you're out in the Midwest, and this I know hit the East too, because I was out there at that time. You know, 2008 financial meltdown, which we know came about because of Wall Street and the demand by libertarians that there should be no regulation on Wall Street. You know, when that economy melted down, it, it hit people in the Midwest probably harder than anyone in the United States, but it also hit national economies, as we well know, Greece, Ireland, et cetera. And, we, and to allow these oligarchs to manipulate our economy in a way that is so destructive of human beings is uh, reprehensible, and, and people should be outraged by it. But Trump is not the answer. Trump is, yeah. Trump is the answer. Will Trump run again in 2024? And would he win? <laughs> Tim Worth, uh, you, you've worked on that issue more than anyone. Uh, do you want to answer Bill Harrop's question? It's Ralph. Ralph's question. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Ralph. You there. <laughs> yeah. Is Tim muted? Okay. This is this is going on. Uh, this is, It's a good indication of how... Uh, how good this subject is that it's going on um, as long as it has. So I'm going to call it to an end and uh, appreciate everybody. We're going to come back at this. We're going to come back to this in a lot of different ways. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thank you, Thank you John. Thanks, John. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, John. Someday soon we'll all be together. All right. Thanks, Jack. <laughs> Look Pleasure. forward to it. Thank you. Aware though, however. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, after a couple of shots, right? Right. Thanks, Rick. Thank you, Rick. Bye bye. Thank okay. you all. Thanks, Pat. Thank you.